Good afternoon and good evening to all. Our first webinar of 2023. It's absolutely insane that 2022 has come and gone just from a perspective of all that we talked about, all that we introduced. For the, the entire group of people at Master Supplements and US Enzymes, it was a very transformative year. And the, the wonderful idea that Jeff had that kind of piggybacked off of the book release from Dr. Eric Belkovich and Kelly um, would, was basically to look at the ideas of all the different fitness factors from the thyroid debacle because there's so much added value over and above um, simply the implementation of supplements in the strategic way that all of us on here who are health professionals can provide to not only the people that are paying us for our our service and expertise, but to your friends and your family, your loved ones, and most importantly, yourselves. You know, now more than ever, I, I think that the idea of self-care and making sure that you're taken care of so you can be the best version of yourself to take care of other people is going to become an absolute necessity because our world is getting faster. And at least in my experience, what I mean by faster is it feels like time speeding up. There's more that we're doing in a day in a shorter period of time. And it's easy to neglect self-care in terms of lifestyle adjuncts. You know, I, I think the reason starting with diet is so important is to bring back some basic foundational wisdom and some, some imperative insights, because I'll be the first to say in my discussions with a lot of other professionals, we don't talk about diet too much. I feel like diet is one of those things that becomes kind of this assumptive, I know enough about it, so therefore I don't need to poke into it anymore. Or as I hope that you'll see in the presentation today, we as professionals kind of allow diet to be a categorized thing. We give someone, we take a name, we uh, understand the premise of the name of that diet, and we just tell the person, follow these instructions with very little follow-up. And before the recording started, you know, Jeff said diet hits home with everyone. And, and my response to that was, of course, well, everyone has to eat. You know, diet is way more foundational in terms of its importance for one's health than any supplement ever will be. And then diet in conjunction with the other lifestyle factors that come together, you know, imagine diet as being a, a single instrument in an orchestra, and that instrument has to be really well-tuned and also expertly played. So today I want to give you my insights when it comes to diet and wellness, because my background is in that. It's actually as a holistic nutritionist, and I more, written more diet plans than I can even remember. And I've written diets for people who are struggling with cancer, all the way up to professional athletes, to the hardest clients in the world, my parents. Hopefully no one asked me questions about what that was like. But without further ado, we want to get going with today's, uh, today's conundrum that I posed to you. So I really wish everyone could talk here. But here's the first question. It's like, if a vegan and a carnivore meet you at a dinner party, who tries to convert you first? And I hope someone's laughing at that because I think I'm somewhat funny. I might not be, but I try. The whole idea of why I ask this is because this is where the world of food is. If you look at the world of social media or in some cases, the entire industry as a whole. And the, the statement I have here is if your identity is somehow intertwined with your relationship to food, I think you're in trouble. Because most people who go to extremes when it comes to diets are in some way, shape, or form trying to heal something inside of themselves. And in some ways, those diets may be very beneficial things for them. And what usually ends up happening is the miraculous change that happens in their lives is such an impactful thing, they start to pass that on to everyone else. And then you have these people that are starting to play for different teams, no differently than someone's favorite football or basketball team. And then these rivalries break out. And the way I look at it is if you take all the emotion out of it, all these different diets really just represent a spectrum. A vegan diet is on one end of the spectrum, a carnivore diet is on the other, and kind of everything in between really does remain a viable option for people. And what I want to do today is set up some basic uh, fundamental understandings as to how to look at diet infrastructure and also how to create a diet and craft it for a specific client you may have in mind, or even just for yourself to maybe clean up some of the edges or, or optimize what it is you're doing. Because at the end of the day, a, a diet is more than simply just fuel for the body. A diet is, is information coming into our bodies that our bodies can take and uh, nourish ourselves and nourish ourselves in order to sustain this thing we're all chasing called health. But we have to kind of get out of the way of dogma. And I hope that everyone on this call kind of has something that they align with 
just to see if the thought of me saying that you should not look at it with the same adoration and emotion pisses you off a little bit, because I think that's a good exercise. When I was teaching, there was this one um, exercise I did with all my students, and it was called the five-day miracle diet. And it was this very structured way of eating where they had to have a very specific food in the morning. They had to have like hard foods at some kind of some time of day, soft foods at the other time of day. There was parameters that were strict guidelines that they had to eat within. And like clockwork, by the second day, everyone was complaining. Everyone was so angry that they couldn't have their avocado toast in the morning or they couldn't have their hemp hearts on their oatmeal or their keto breakfast, whatever they were doing. And everyone got so into the negativity of the experience, they didn't realize that the exercise was not about the diet. It was about being a client who's being told to do something totally different from anything they've ever done before. And just seeing how hard it was to adopt massive change overnight, implement it and sustain it. And half of the students just gave up. And I know they gave me, you know, BS assignments, you know, saying that they completed the diet and they just didn't. So if we're dogmatic about diet, it's going to be very hard for us to actually relate to our clients with what it is they need. Example, there are scenarios where I think someone needs a vegan diet if they're wanting to do some degree of healing. Do I believe veganism is the be all and end all for everyone and anyone? Absolutely not. But as a health professional, I need to understand that I need to put my bias aside sometimes to do what it is I need to do for my client. Same thing with a supplement. I may think a certain supplement is the greatest thing in the world and everyone needs to be on it. I give it to my client. They have a horrible experience and I have to do something else. That's client care. So when it comes to diet and dogma, I think they're synonymous today. And I always like to poke fun at the, the health industry because you kind of have to. So this is the liver king. He's actually holding a cow's liver, which he's taking a bite of, and it's raw. There is a lot of charlatanism when it comes to the world of diet and wellness. So what this guy did is he created an entire movement for young males who wanted to be alpha males to look like him by saying all he does is follow his nine ancestral tenants, to which they're good pieces of advice, walk barefoot, get circadian rhythm optimized, eat nutritionally dense foods, blah, blah, blah. But what he forgot to tell everyone is he was taking about a three to $4,000 a month cocktail of steroids and growth hormones and was claiming to be all natural in terms of how he looked based upon eating the diet that it is he eats. This is another thing that people perpetuate, and I think it's why we as health professionals need to return to our fundamental first principles and double down on brushing up when it comes to our knowledge of food and nutrition, because food and diet aren't as sexy as the coolest, latest gadgets out there, but the impact they can have is so much more profound than anything else we can do, because fundamentally nature created food in a perfect way to be absolutely in harmony with what our physiology needs. So much so that it's not only geographically specific, it's also seasonal, and it's also available in different quantities based upon likely what humans are, are in need of. So when you see people like this touting that any kind of diet is the greatest thing ever and everyone needs to do it, if it smells like a turd, if it looks like a turd, it probably is one. That being said, I'm sure some people can do quite well with this. In my opinion, the way a diet affect someone's health is not too dissimilar to how a supplement does. So if you look at the two diets here, we have very, very different fundamental makeups of these foods. On the left, the food looks very much like it came from in nature. And if you notice, there's some very interesting characteristics. There's natural, colorful pigmentations. There's different sizes and shapes, but there's a, there's a general shape that um, kind of looks very man-made. There's circles, there's, there's different aspects of natural shapes in terms of how things grow. On the right-hand side, uh, everything here looks like it's either uniform as a circle or a square. It's been cut out of some mold. There are colors, but you wouldn't want to put those colors in your body and have your liver detoxify tartrazine and the red and blue dyes in these foods. So the diet is the input. The diet is the information that goes into the body. And our body has this infinite wisdom to know how to take the nutritional information in absorb, utilize that information for a specific outcome. And the output is essentially the resulting health, or in many cases in the Western world, the resulting decline in health. Because if someone's eating the diet on the right-hand side, what do you think the manifestation of how well their cells are going to function and operate is going to be? It's going to be a, a, an absolute train wreck given enough time 
because while they're getting enough calories, they're not getting any actual nutrition. So the first and foremost thing to understand is food is information. The quality of the information that's going in is going to be directly related to the quality of health that comes out. Because it really does come down to this. We've, we've examined the cells to organism model. So we as the organism are actually um, a very strategic amalgamation of trillions upon trillions of cells organized in different ways. And that organization has a fundamental hierarchy. And when it comes to the ability to sustain our health, the information that comes in from the food we eat is actually interpreted by the cells on an individual cellular level. And the things that we need on a regular basis to keep these things healthy are, you know, in not specific order, but likely to, to some degree, oxygen first and foremost. So, you know, we're all breathing and the better quality air we get, the um, less contaminants that come along with that oxygen. And the second thing is water. I hope everyone here talks to their clients about the quality of the water they're drinking. And when I say water filter, I'm not talking like a Brita countertop filter, although it's better than tap water. A basic carbon charcoal filter might filter out a little bit of chlorine, but you know, municipal tap water has various compounds in there at levels that are likely hazardous to human health. So the higher the quality of water you can consume, knowing that, you know, by volume, we're 76% water, but by molecular, you know, solution, if you will, the human cell is about 99% water. All of these, these chemical reactions take place in an optimally hydrated state. Then we have amino acids, fatty acids, sugars, which we'll talk about the more complex forms of, and micronutrients. And this is what a cell needs on a regular basis in order to take in so it can continue to work and make enough energy. Because if you want to sound like the absolute smartest person at a dinner party, the reason we breathe is to essentially combine oxygen with in the final electron acceptor in the mitochondria to create essentially ATP and water. And the Food we eat, the carbohydrates and the fats are the energy sources, and the amino acids and the micronutrients are the building blocks and the cofactors to make this whole thing work. So you can think of energy production as a very highly choreographed dance, and energy is life. It's absolutely everything, and the, the quality of the food we eat and the amount of nutrition that comes along with those calories are directly correlated to the quality of energy we can make, the amount of energy we can make, and thus the health of our bodies. But that's looking at things on a very microscopic scientific level. So how do we translate this into diet? Well, what are the fundamentals of what a diet must contain? And I love this little graphic on the right-hand side because we all know someone who's the person on the right-hand side made up of you know nature's bounty of produce. And I'm sure we know people who are on the left-hand side who haven't seen a vegetable you know, other than something from a frozen package in maybe two years, it's fresh. So the water thing we've taken care of, <clears throat> amino acids are proteins. And the quality of the protein we eat directly relates to the quality of the amino acids that we get. There are complete and incomplete proteins and understanding which are which is absolutely essential for making sure that we're adequate in terms of our protein status. Then we have our fats. Man, if there's been a micronutrient that's still vilified in the baby boomer generation, it's fats. Because a lot of people still think that eating fat makes you fat maybe eating too much fat in terms of overall calories can have some degree of an effect from there, but fats are an incredibly high quality energy source providing their healthy saturate, mono and polyunsaturated fats. Anything in the makeup of trans fats or uh, chemically modified polyunsaturated oils, sunflower oil, safflower, canola, which isn't even a thing, it's rapeseed oil, the most unfortunate name in nutrition. <laughs> Those fats are highly toxic and, and can be very pro-inflammatory just by the nature of their overconsumption. And in the Western world, our omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is extremely high in favor of, of, of omega-6s because they proliferate the fast food industry and the, the cheap processed manufacturing food industry. And then we come to carbohydrates. So if fats were the villain of the 80s and 90s, carbs have become the villain of the early 2000s because... Carbs are the thing that now make you fat. And the reality is a body that can't convert calories into energy is what actually makes someone gain a lot of weight. The quality of the carbohydrates you eat are very important. All carbohydrates become sugars. And as a result of that, the speed at which those carbohydrates break down to sugars and the nutrition that comes along with them 
is more so the, the, the topic for consideration there. If you use the concept of 80 calories of an apple and 80 calories of a slice of white bread, they likely have the same amount of carbohydrates. However, the apple is going to have a lot more fiber. The apple is going to have a lot more vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. So what you're getting along with those carbohydrates is not only going to help the body turn those carbs into energy because you get nature's cofactors with them, but the ability to negatively affect your blood sugar and also feed your microbiome because the fiber we eat is not simply for us to, to basically make a solid bowel movement. Fiber is an absolute necessity when it comes to feeding the critters that live inside of our gut because they make these things called postbiotics, which are these short chain carbon molecules that act as signaling molecules between the microbiome or the microbes that live in the microbiome, the immune system and the gut enteric nervous system. So we have to understand that carbohydrates, fiber, along with vitamins and minerals is really the conversation that we have to have. And then we have to understand how our body relates to these items matters really importantly, as we shall see, because I'm going to get into what that statement actually means. So this is my personal observation, not only in practice, but I'll say I'll expand it to life because when I go to, um, if I'm ever at a health conference and it's lunchtime and you see me scanning the room, it's because I'm watching what health professionals do when it comes to their own diet, because I've noticed that some, sometimes there is a, a gap or a distance between what people preach and what people practice. And it's like the idea of the cardiologist who smokes. It's like you're, you're, you're espousing information to people, but if you don't practice it, there's a degree of not only inauthenticity, but experientially, you don't have that wisdom to share with people. And I do believe that many health professionals underweight the importance of diet because let's be honest, it is quite nuanced. It takes a lot of time to teach people about diet. You're hoping that they're going to execute because you can't follow people home. I mean, you can, but a restraining order might make it a little bit hard to, to keep that client working with you. So you're going to hope that the people are going to take your advice and, and within a shadow of a doubt, execute and sustain what it is that you're wanting them to do. But this is where I think a huge opportunity is because be, due to the fact that people don't place the important, uh, the importance rather on diet, over time, the gap begins to exist between practical knowledge and mindful execution. So what do we do? We ultimately go with um, the diet names. We don't go deeper than that to understand the biochemical impetus of what a specific diet is meant to do. We will give someone a handout to say, hey, you're following a low carb diet. You're following a ketogenic diet. You're following um, a low FODMAP or a low histamine diet. But we have to really understand the reason why that diet has been constructed. And, and if we don't understand it at that level, we don't necessarily know if that diet is actually something that is designed to be in sync with what our client needs. So as a professional, I think you need to have the biochemical understanding of dietary knowledge, know what the makeup of the macro and the micronutrients are and how that's going to affect someone, i.e. someone with insulin resistance and why a higher fat, lower carb diet might be a good thing for the metabolic health. But then you have to know how to make that into something that tastes good. You have to have some sort of culinary expertise or insights to know how to preserve our food or at least not destroy the nutritional nature of food when you're cooking it. And then there's the practical knowledge in terms of how to eat, not only the process of mindful eating, but how to structure that diet in an optimal way to suit that client's lifestyle, their likes and their dislikes, and their readiness to change and their ability to adopt something new. So in my opinion, I'll say it again, health professionals need to step up their own dietary practices and not marginalize its importance in healthcare because it really is a foundational underpinning. So this is what it is I've constructed. I call it my diet bed mass. And if anyone remembers, I guess it would be early high school algebra, Bed mass is the order of operations for solving an equation. So this is my dietary solution for this equation that a lot of people don't necessarily know how to make simplistically enough for people to understand and adopt it. The first thing is understand that there is no one diet. I would say the only caveat to that is that the one diet for everyone is the one that nature gives us, meaning the food that we're including in that diet should be foundational across the board where whole foods are always selected in favor of processed foods. From there, the most important thing is deciding when you eat. Most people would probably go to what. I'll explain why I go to when. Then we go to what you eat. Then we go to how you eat. So it's a one, two, three step impl implementation 
And then there are adjunct considerations for food planning, uh, culinary preparation, which, which takes into account the skill or the um, willingness to participate for the individual. And then understanding when you implement something, unless you have a crystal ball, you don't know how it's going to go. You might suggest that someone tries a higher fat diet because you've heard it's really good for metabolic health and mitochondrial function. But what you're not aware of is they have really poor gallbladder function and the high fat diet has given them disaster pants and they chose to wear white. That's a bad day for someone. You no know, one as an adult wants to crap themselves. So it's understanding the differences in um, the foundational aspects of the diet versus what that client experiences when they implement it. And this is where you work back and forth with someone to really understand what it is they need. You do need to denote that there is some aspect of biochemical individuality. We're all unique beings that are ever changing. So if you really want to blow your mind, sit and think through this thought process. Technically, there is a unique diet for every human that walks the planet with slight differences from one to the next. And generally speaking, day to day, your nutritional needs are not static. So some days you'll need more carbohydrates, some days you'll need less. Some days you'll need more B vitamins, some days you'll need less. And that's where we're not as an industry right now. We can't actually determine the individual nuance of what a person needs day to day. There are some cool tips and tricks. You can use breath ketone monitors, continuous glucose monitors, and you can give someone objective information based upon what it is they're doing. You can even use something like heart rate variability to see if dietary changes yield a positive aspect to their nervous systems based upon reducing inflammation. But I think the important takeaway is the optimal diet for a person not can change, I should probably say will change as they do. If someone's insulin resistant, and then a year and a half from that moment, they're no longer insulin resistant, their body is more efficient with processing carbohydrates, so their dietary restrictions can change. Because the ultimate truth is what I've underlined there, in my opinion. When someone is unhealthy, diet matters more. Someone with an autoimmune condition might not be able to get away with pizza night with a family compared to someone who has no you know, overt subjective symptoms that they're experiencing with their health. So the, the understanding is when you're implementing a diet and it's very strict and rigid, there is a necessity for that to be for the person to get out of crisis mode. Their body has a very low bandwidth of stress tolerance when it comes to eating foods that are either trigger foods or something that they have developed sensitivities or allergies to. As they get healthier, that typically becomes something that they have a little bit more leeway with. And the other consideration that's really important is sometimes when someone's been on one extreme for a long period of time, and I, I've seen this with a couple of people, someone who's been a long time vegan needs to swing all the way to the other side of the spectrum in order to regain what they've become very deficient in, because what they can't get in one diet, they get in abundance in another. And you know the opposite is true. Someone who's like a meat and potatoes guy, it's all he's ever eaten. He's never looked twice at a vegetable or a fruit. Maybe implementing, you know, a juice diet to kickstart some sort of weight loss process or to help bring down high levels of blood cholesterol, what have you. It's really all about what the situation calls for. And this is where your unique perspectives as experts really do come in. So this is why when you eat is a really easy way to start because convincing someone of changing everything about their diet overnight, I wish you luck. Take someone who's never eaten a vegetable and give them a plate of broccoli, that plate is going to get smashed against the wall. So telling someone to start changing their habits by simply reducing the amount of time they allow themselves to eat is a great starting point because it's a lot harder to eat 5,000 calories in six hours than it is in 12 hours. That's assuming there's allowance because humans are the only creatures that give themselves license to eat around the clock. We can store anything we want in the fridge or anything in the dry pantry. We can Uber Eats food to ourselves at one in the morning. Uh, it's really actually shameful what some people do with food because when you don't treat food as a sacred thing, it's just simply either an activity or something to satisfy an urge or a need. So in a 24 hour period, the first concept I always go into is the concept of the eating window. And the assessment of this can be multifactorial. It can be based upon age, activity level, body weight, body composition, muscle mass, and also their intended goal. So if you start with 12 hours of eating, 12 hours of fasting, you can simply play with the eating window to suit what the client's desires are. Typically speaking, we get success for most people when it comes to the concept of 
caloric restriction, um, reductions in inflammation, enhanced fat metabolism. And if you read the research, life extension, when we have a shorter eating window with a longer window of fasting, because we develop a circadian rhythm with food. The whole idea is when we wake up first thing in the morning and the sun rises, our bodies have this natural wake up process. We have uh, a rise of cortisol when the light hits our eyes. We have an increase in blood pressure. We have an increase in heart rate. Our sympathetic nervous system fires up to get, a, to get us going. And we are in need of food because we've spent the better part of, I hope, six to nine hours sleeping and fasting. If you compare that and contrast that with the evening, if you're sitting in front of the TV at 10 o'clock and you've had three meals that day and you're watching Netflix, are you really in need of energy dense foods at that moment in time? No. And not only are you not in need of them, your body is far less, far less efficient at processing them into energy. So the likelihood of storing those calories as body fat is much greater. Not only that, but it also disrupts your ability to get restful sleep. And eating at night when your digestive system wants a break to clean itself out negatively impacts the microbiome. So I think it's really important to understand that for most people, the simple concept to explain to them is if they're wanting to burn the energy stored on their body, it's really easy to do that, relatively speaking, when no food is coming in versus when they're eating around the clock or they're eating every two or three hours because they were told that balances their blood sugar and keeps their metabolism stoked and burning, which is another horrible piece of advice. So that's why we start with when you select the eating window, you uh, approximate and appropriate that to your client based upon what you think they need and their specific goals. And then you move on to the what. What I always like to abide by is if you eat things that grow as close to nature as can be, you're on the right track. And, you know, when people use made of natural ingredients and they put it on a label of something that's sitting on a shelf, that's creative marketing. But the, at the end of the day, nature doesn't make a mistake. The quality of proteins in land and sea proteins are essentially the highest because they have a complete amino acid profile. The various kinds of micronutrients, um, macronutrient compositions, the different kinds of colorful pigments and fibers in all kinds of produce, you're not going to get better than that in a supplement. And then understanding that some people do well with grains, some don't. Some people do well with legumes, some don't. That's very much subjective to what the person needs. And the most important aspect besides, you know, our macronutrients here with the above uh, categories are the quality of the oils we use in cooking. So many people have so much low hanging fruit to improve just based upon the kinds of oils they keep in their house. An oil should never be in a plastic bottle, in my opinion, that sits on a shelf for months at a time that has no specific taste, no specific uh, color that distinguishes, distinguishes it from others. Uh, and it shouldn't be cheap. And the quality of the cooking oils you use is being infused in all the food. And it's really important to understand that high quality oils can help actually extract more nutrition from the food that you're eating. And when you use the right herbs and spices, which not only have antioxidants in and of themselves, but they help to enrich flavor profiles of the food we're eating, you don't need to be a five-star Michelin chef. Well, actually, that's not a thing. Three-star Michelin chef is the highest in the world. You don't need to be a three-star Michelin chef in order to make something simple taste good. So the what you eat has some additional considerations. If you want to go towards optimal, seasonality is always perfect. When I lived in Canada, one thing that I did very little was eat a lot of fruit in the winter. Never bananas, because people would ask me why. I'd say, show me the banana tree. It's in Ecuador, and that's not aligned with my locale or my geographical location. So understanding that seasonality affects the quality of the food, because if you're eating something in the dead of winter that's been shipped from South Africa, the question is, when was, that, when was that food picked in the first place? How was it ripened? And what is the nutritional status in it in the first place? Or is it actually dead food? And then we have the concept of protein quality. So fish farms versus wild-caught seafood. I've flown over a fish farm. I don't eat uh, salmon at sushi restaurants for that very reason, because I've seen the quality of the water that a lot of them swim in. And then there's the ethical raising of the animals. You know, what kind of food are these animals given? What environment are they, are they in? How are they slaughtered? So anything that's an environmentally optimized land proteins is always going to be a much better play for not only your health, um, but for the, the environment as a whole. Then there's the growing conditions. And this is where there's a lot of deb debate of conventional versus organic. Fundamentally, I think the most important consideration is the one thing that is not allowed in organically grown food is glyphosate. 
And the reason I'll highlight glyphosate is not only is it a, a horrible mitochondrial toxin in high doses, but it is number is probably the number one thing that disrupts our microbiome and it disrupts the ability for our microbes to do a few things. Number one, it disrupts their ability to network in a diverse state because it is an antimicrobial agent. In addition to that, it disrupts the ability for those microbes to turn aromatic amino acids into things like neurotransmitters. It disrupts the ability for them to create postbiotics with short carbon molecules and it disrupts the communication pathway between the microbiome, the immune system, and the enteric nervous system of the gut. So if there's a reason to choose organic food over any other conventional food, I think that's number one, far and above the rest. And then there's some, some less important, but still important considerations. So the degree of processing of the food that you're eating, you know, if there's a, a nutritional label with a, a bunch of things that you can't pronounce, it's probably better that you don't eat that. And then there's the consideration of shopping frequency and perishability. Uh, foods from nature start to break themselves down quite quickly. So it's always a better idea to shop more frequently if you have the ability to do so and buy items that are more fresh rather than leave them to denature and wilt in the fridge for a little bit too long. And the most important aspect of all this for your client is obviously the cost factor. If we're dealing with a family of five, you know, eating organic produce is getting incredibly expensive. So I think it's the most important consideration because you have to work within the real parameters and realistic opportunities of what that client allows for and do the best you can with what they're willing to do. That's why what is so important. And these are the, the questions that I always ask is, you know, where does your food come from? If you get to know a farmer versus just going to a grocery store, I think that's a win on a multitude of scales because so much attention needs to be brought back to farming. The average age of a farmer in North America is approaching 70. And the small family organic farms are being shut down in favor of big foods ability to take them over and, and convert you know, what we're supposed to grow from nature into franken food. The second thing a lot of people don't really think about is food rotation and food variety. The, the average American eats between nine and 13 different foods in total, meaning like the, the variety of food they eat in their life is nine to 13 different items. And food variety is one thing that builds a, a more robust microbiome because what you eat, your gut microbes also get directly exposed to. And if you're eating the same nine to 11 foods, it's going to be horribly imbalanced from a, a nutritional perspective because you're likely going to be missing a high quantity of vitamins and minerals. And so many people are subclinically unwell because they have what are called long latent nutritional deficiencies. And it's really important that we understand the context here because there are high protein diets. Protein is something that is important for tissue formation. It is a building block structure with nitrogen. And protein considerations range across the board from someone who's a pro athlete who's trying to recover, someone who's you know an 85-year-old senior citizen who's trying to ward off um, sarcopenia and muscle wasting. So understanding that setting an appropriate protein goal for what you eat is a foundational aspect. Second thing is understanding the difference between all kinds of carbohydrates. The kinds of carbohydrates that I think should be vilified are simple processed carbohydrates. White bread, sugar, crackers, um, baked goods, things of that nature, because they're an incredibly concentrated source of energy that will offend your blood sugar. And they will also do nothing but deplete your body of vitamins and minerals because they require the cofactors that are already there to convert them into ATP energy. But the kinds of carbohydrates that nature provides are far, far different. If you do a blood sugar test after you eat 50 grams of white rice and 50 grams of sweet potato, you will see a drastic difference in how the body processes those root vegetables because of the quantity of fibers and the complexity of the carbohydrates. So when you're feeding your clients certain kinds of carbohydrates or yourselves, always go for the high fiber, um, nutritionally dense carbohydrates that grow in nature from the ground, they grow off trees, things of that nature. Fats is another thing, and we briefly discussed this, but you know, fats can be a very beneficial source of fuel, but in extreme quantities of fat can also wreak havoc in various ways. If someone is doing uh, a ketogenic diet that consists of nothing other than butter, bacon, and mayonnaise, what do you think that does to the microbiome? And what stress do you think that places upon the liver and the gallbladder? 
it really is going to change how the body can effectively convert that food into energy if there are already compromises within those aspects of physiologic function. So when it comes to understanding the diet, the perspective with how these things become practical aspects of someone's day-to-day -day life are really important when it comes to food and diet. And then there's the last one. There's how you eat. So it's really not about food. It's about digestion because my old... Uh, old line is the best diet in the world not well digested is in some ways worse than the least optimal diet properly digested because food doesn't simply begin when the food sorry digestion doesn't simply begin when the food goes in your stomach it begins by being in a proper state in order for your body to receive that food and properly process absorb and utilize it because the cephalic phase of digestion is when you actually either begin thinking about food or let's say you walk into a room and all of a sudden you're hit with the aroma of whatever's cooking on the stove. Your salivary glands turn on, your, you know, your, your vagus nerve fires up, and that's what actually primes the rest of the digestive cascade. And then the second thing is the lost art of chewing. Most people just hoof food down their face, me being a former version of that, because it's something that just needs to get done. When I was a personal trainer, and I put this in the article, I prided myself and being able to eat a whole meal in the five minutes between one of my client sessions ending and the five minutes of the next one warming up on the treadmill. And it really did a, a number on my digestive system that took quite some time to come back online because in the game of neurology, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if you downregulate vagal tone because you're in a perpetual straight state of sympathetic stress, that's going to really compromise digestive secretions and peristalsis so the environment in which you eat really matters. I do believe eating is ritual and a simple act of giving a little bit more importance to eating, chewing more thoroughly and eating in a more optimized environment will help a client who's struggling with health issues because the vast majority of people eat in the following ways. They eat in their cars or they just you know eat something at their desk and they don't take a proper break. They'll quickly pop out for a bite alone in a restaurant or what most people do nowadays, start scrolling through social media or YouTube and watching something whole, possibly emotionally um, evocative while eating, or they'll just eat while on a Zoom call and they'll just, you know, mute their microphone and put their camera on black. And none of these things properly allows for proper activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. If you look at the right-hand side, activation of vagal tone not only stimulates the flow of saliva, and we know that salivary amylase, the enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates, if it's not properly mixed with your food, totally compromises the rest of the digestive cascade when it comes to breaking down complex and simple sugars. But the same is also true for the other organs of digestion. Peristalsis, the movement of food through the, intest the intestines from the gut level is actually signaled and regulated by the vagus nerve, but also the release of bile, the release of pancreatic enzymes, uh, the communication of what happens within the microbiome back up to the brain to signal satiety is all down to the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve being properly activated. So we can't default the importance of that when we're teaching someone how to do this stuff properly. And then when it comes to food planning and culinary considerations, you know, who's preparing your food? Are you eating at home? Or are you eating out where something's more like a food assembly line? And if no one's cooking at home, not only are you not putting the love into your food, you don't actually know what's being put into your food. And food preparation is becoming a lost art, unfortunately, because the nature of life is becoming increasingly busy, increasingly complex. And we're looking for simple solutions like these ready-made food kits that get dropped off at the house but we don't really know how fresh those ingredients are or where they came from. So understanding that you buying your food and you committing to cooking for yourself and for your families is basically you saying, I choose my health over convenience. And, and hopefully you can carve out the time to do that and let something that's far less important always give. And the last thing I'll, I'll visit here is what we talked about before, you know, how often are you changing what it is you're eating? I want you to all think about what everyone in the family eats on a regular basis. You know, is it spaghetti on Mondays, tacos on Tuesdays, Fridays we do pizza night, Saturdays we barbecue burgers in the summer. If it's the same rotation all the time, injecting a little bit of, you know, passion and a little bit of interest to try something new and adventurous is a really cool way for everyone to actually fall in love with the idea of food together as a family. 
And what your body tells you is, is an important thing. And the lost art of symptom analysis, I think in some ways is being lost in favor of functional lab testing where, you know, someone will read a, a stool test and the pancreatic elastase numbers will be very high, but the client will say, oh, I have heartburn all the time. Oh, I'm bloated every time I eat. And the practitioner will go, well, your pancreas is fine. So it's not a digestive problem. Guys, the body never lies. Any of these uh, outcomes post meal consumption, any of these situations that the body arises as a result of food could mean that something in your diet is not optimally aligned with your physiology. And understanding how to maybe correlate some of these things with imbalances you see on functional labs, but also maybe trying to modify dietary practices to see if it alleviates some of these stresses is a really important thing. So a lot of the times, all of these things can, can be from some simple change that needs to be made that may be something that is elusive to most practitioners unless they dive into the world of diet. So from a final thought perspective, before I get into a fun little exercise, I think if we want to make it simplistic enough, we can boil it down to these concepts. Where it goes wrong from a food perspective is really what's being eaten and how it's being eaten. And the what encompasses the food eating window in addition to the items, and then the how it's being eaten are the conditions under which your client is regularly eating. It's a game of habits. So understanding that the more times they choose the optimal road in terms of the what or the how is gonna have a huge return on investment six months or 12 months down the line. And the opposite is true as well. And then from a body perspective, this is what we're doing in terms of supporting you guys as a company with the products we make, because if it's a digestive issue, it's a microbiome or an immune system issue, all of these work in concert to determine how a food can be something that is a nutritious item for the body versus food being something that is a, uh, a stimulant in a negative way and a potential allergen that triggers the immune system and results in an inflammatory response. So I hope that this is a really... Um, easy and concise way to round everything out. And as per usual, I'll be sending the slides to Jeff and everyone who does the 10 will be getting them. So I hope that was beneficial. So this is how I look at creating a diet. And I hope this resonates with you guys in terms of establishing your version of this, because you do have to inject your own style and your own approach and specialty to this. For me, the first thing I always do is assess any symptoms, variables, or conditions that we're working with. Is it a healthy person or is it someone who's dealing with multiple autoimmune conditions? That matters. The second thing I do is I establish an eating window, as mentioned before. And the reason for that is to better optimize and reflect the construction of the diet for what the client is hoping to achieve as an outcome. Then what I do is I select the best diet paradigm that aligns with, here's the most important part, personal desire, as well as scientific approach. If you choose something that your client doesn't like, I wish you luck in finding a way to get them to stick to or adhere to it. Because you need to then assess the degree of commitment, the ability they have to commit to that, and the culinary skill they currently possess to turn that food into something that they can feed themselves or feed their families. This can be where consulting with someone who's a chef, a food preparation specialist, a nutritionist can be really helpful because the education that you can impart to that client is wisdom that they'll carry for the rest of their lives. We also then determine a protein target. We select the cooking oils that we use on a regular basis based upon what they're using now. And then finally, we assess what they're gonna eat in terms of seasonal availability. We create mindful eating practices that work for the client because you do really have to uh, fit the client who they are and how their life is currently constructed to make it work as best as it can for them now and then slowly push them to some shifts in terms of making it more optimal down the line. And you can apply any kind of dietary paradigm approach to this, and you can modify this as it goes because it's in some ways a drop-down menu. I did create a couple different case studies that I've, I've used before. What I might do in, for the sake of time is skip over these, but it shows you how I take a concept of the person, who they are, and I go from step one to eight, the decisions that I make in order to suit this person and what it is we found success with. So I did one for a pro athlete client of mine, and I also did one for uh, an, you know, a retired, quote unquote, former executive client of mine to show you how I can take the same fundamental framework, modify the different variables, 
and optimize it and personalize it to this client in order to create a successful outcome that the person not only feels good with, they feel good implementing and they can sustain and stick to in a lasting way. Because I do wanna leave a little bit of time for questions if there are any at the end. And I do wanna talk a little bit about some of our featured products that I think don't get enough attention. The first one I wanna go into is actually Proteinzyme. Nowadays, the quality of the food we eat is <clears throat> calorically rich, but nutritionally deficient. And if someone is used to a very processed food diet, totally throwing them to the other side, you know, short-term motivation leads to failure kind of thing might actually be the worst thing that you can do. So as a nutritionist, one of the questions I ask is, how can I implement something better than what they're doing now that they're willing to do and sustain with? And something like Proteinzyme is a wonderful thing because not only is it a quality protein source, especially for people who don't, don't want or don't respond well to whey protein, but the micronutrient fiber and probiotic blend as a result of some of the additional ingredients in here is going to facilitate replacing what is missing in most people's diet. And that's micronutrients, antioxidants, and fiber. So even though it can kind of be looked at as a meal replacement, it really is more of a protein supplement because calorically a scoop of this is about 110 calories and 110 calories is really nothing for the average person. But if you combine this with other items to create something of a meal replacement smoothie, some frozen berries, half an avocado, some unsweetened coconut, potentially some almond milk, stuff of that nature, this is a really cool thing for people who are just starting their journey into becoming healthier. They want something that tastes good, and they also want something that's convenient. So I think something like this is a great base or a great starting point for a, a meal replacement smoothie that has a caloric profile that actually approximates replacing a meal, something in the six to 800 calorie range, but also has a high dose of protein with healthy fats, fiber-rich carbohydrates, and a high quantity of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and fibers. The concept that I would leave with you here is when you're creating a diet, the most important thing you can do is create a nutritionally optimized, calorically appropriate diet. Most people do the opposite. They have a <laughs> calorically inappropriate, nutritionally deficient diet. So a, a key concept that I teach people is for every calorie you eat, what is a nutritional load? And if we go back to the example of the apple versus the white bread, in the 80 calories of white bread, I'm getting simple carbohydrates and maybe some artificially enriched vitamins that the government mandates I have to put back in the bread. If I'm getting a fresh organic apple that I picked off a tree, I'm getting vitamins, minerals, fibers, antioxidants, and low glycemic carbohydrates. So even though 80 calories is 80 calories, to the body, it really isn't. And the second aspect to this is looking at the aspect of fiber supplementation in addition to fiber coming from the diet. I did mention that fibers are carbohydrates and they're uniquely constructed in the way that we as humans don't have the enzymes to break their bonds and extract calories from them. However, our microbes can. And the different colonies of microbes living in our microbiome work together in some cases to partially convert fibers to small molecules, and then the enzymes that are basically existing in other microbes can finish the job and convert fiber into something like a short-chain fatty acid, or a compound and antioxidant in food into something like a urolithin or some other signaling molecule. Because postbiotics and metabolic health have a very closely coupled relationship. There is this concept of an obesogenic microbiome, for example. The microbiome of someone who has metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, stuff of that nature, has a distinctly different makeup from the, the microbiome profile of a young, healthy, lean, active individual. And it's interesting that, remember, the, the body, the host, is always working in concept to create a symbiotic relationship with the microbiome. So the obesogenic microbiome actually becomes more efficient at harvesting calories from the food you eat. And if you're not eating large amounts of fibers and you're eating high quality quantities of simple sugars, these can get processed and chemically modified into high calorie containing molecules that can impact negatively circulating triglycerides, blood sugar, HbA1c, stuff of that nature. So we need to understand that 
fibers are functional ways to modulate the microbiome populations and thus overall health in a way that we need to understand that food first, and then if someone isn't doing the job properly from a food-based perspective, strategically using different kinds of fibers that are shown to be beneficial to certain populations of microbes that may be underrepresented, such as bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, stuff of that nature, can be very beneficial. Just as I say that, it's worth mentioning that other fibers, things like chicory root or inulin, some of these um, general food fibers that you may find in processed you know, meal replacement bars or meal replacement shakes, they may have a detrimental effect on, on helping to support the growth of colonies of microbes that may lead to a state of dysbiosis. So understanding that sun fiber is our basic fiber supplement, sun spectrum is sun fiber plus antioxidant and anti-inflammatory compounds, specifically curcumin and coenzyme Q10. And then true fiber is sun fiber with an addition of the different profiles of bifidogenic enzymes that help to break down fibers and likely support the growth of specific colonies of microbes so you can enhance the diversity of what's going on in the microbiome. We have to remember it is an ecosystem and that ecosystem is in constant communication with itself, meaning microbes are communicating via small molecules and quorum sensing all the time they're communicating with our gut immune system to educate the immune system on how to make changes to keep the inside of the body strategically safe. The microbiome is communicating with the enteric nervous system locally, but it's also communicating systemically with the gut brain axis and all other aspects of the body via small molecules being secreted into the bloodstream and being able to cross the blood brain barrier. So I know that was a lot of information, everyone. I hope that a lot of that stuff did resonate when it comes to the concept of diet. And it, it hopefully stimulated your return to falling in love with the concept of diet and food. You know, if you look all over the world, food is life. Food is culture. It is wisdom. And every culture in the world has so many different options and strategies for turning the, the base ingredients that nature provides into a multitude of different flavorful and health enhancing compounds. So with that, I thank everyone for the time. I will uh, take a quick pause and then we'll get into any specific questions. Mm -hmm.